pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. This is going to be my first video with a glass of wine. Let's see how this goes. Will it be an enhancement or or whatever the opposite of a enhancement is? Disenchantment? <laughs> we'll see how it goes. I'm planning to do two videos back to back and edit them and get them up over the next few days. And I'm allowing myself one glass of wine per video. So let's get started. The first one that I want to do is I was moved to do this immediately after watching Eric Carl Anderson's video, which he has titled uh, Awkward Encounters with Authors at Book Signings. And I loved his video so much. Please see the link in the show notes. It's wonderful. It's not only his video is not only funny, but you know, he makes himself pretty vulnerable in chronicling and describing in such detail his moments of embarrassment or humiliation. With writers and I've actually been kicking around doing a similar video uh, since I started on booktube so I thought well there's no time like the present uh, maybe this will become a thing that'll go around booktube because many of us have had such moments so I have I'm not going to limit myself to awkward encounters and I'm not going to limit myself to book signing but mostly they will be awkward book signing uh, stories the first three I, <laughs> I've got a list of maybe nine or ten here. The first three I'm going to keep the author's name anonymous. I don't want to embarrass them. They're alive and still active in the literary world with varying degrees of celebrity. Or that I don't want to talk about how my feelings got hurt <laughs> and mention their name in the same story and have them uh, you know, find it by doing a, a YouTube search of their name or something. The first one is an author, a gay writer, who has penned one of my favorite gay novels, so I may or may not have talked about it in my recent video about some of my favorite gay fiction, Plausible Denial. He was at a gay writers conference that I went to in Boston in the late 1990s, and I was so excited to meet him, I made con reached out and made contact with him by email before we met, and then we met at the conference, and he was very shy, and I wasn't particularly expecting that we were going to fall into bed or fall in love or anything like that, but I had responded so deeply to the man's novel that the complete absence of any interpersonal connection between us was really jarring. Like, we we tried to talk two or three times, I got him to sign my book, and he was... Well, friendly's a bit too strong of a word, but he wasn't unfriendly, but... There was just no connection, and it just confused the hell out of me that I could connect so deeply with somebody's writing, but to have not even one iota of a connection in real life. So uh, that's all I want to say about that. This one's kind of the opposite. It was actually at the same. <laughs> it was at the same uh, writers' conference in Boston, and he was an up-and-coming novelist. I think he'd had two or maybe only one novel published at that time in the late 1990s. And I had quite enjoyed the one that I'd read. It wasn't one of my favorites, but it was very good. It spoke about gay life. I believe it was set in Provincetown. I don't want to give you too many clues. Or you're going to figure out which one. But I enjoyed it. You know, it, it, was reson it resonated with my experience and I liked the author photo on the back. And then I met him at the conference and I went up to talk to him to get my book signed. And he, you know, just imagine how hot I was in the 1990s. <laughs> I was just a little bit hotter than I am now. <laughs> and uh, he liked me. And he was just all over me. I don't mean... He was flirting with me and the, and the sexual energy. He was a very beautiful man. And, and he was just so gushy. And uh, I knew that he wanted to, to get into my pants, or at least. Or probably that's all. And, uh, uh, okay, so he invited me to a party of all the writers, and it was going to be at some famous person's house, and he drew me a map, and he said, are you going to come, are you going to come? I said, yeah, I will come, I will come. So I followed his map that night, and it was quite a ways from wherever I was staying, or wherever the conference center was. I didn't know Boston from a hole in the ground. It's the only time I've ever been in Boston. I managed to find my way to the house, and I, I stood outside the 
door of that house and I heard all the party noises talking and laughing. And there I am, this maybe 30-year-old Saskatchewan-born farmer's son. I lived in Toronto. I was a little bit more urbane. But I, I just totally lost my nerve and I didn't go. I, I walked back to my hotel. And uh, boy, do I ever regret that because he really wanted me to come to the party and I chickened out. All right, how's the time? Okay. The last one that I will talk about anonymously was with a, a Canadian woman writer, quite well known. We're not talking Margaret Atwood, well known, but you know, not too far down on the tier from that. And I had one or maybe two of her books in hand at maybe Harborfront Writers Festival or some kind of a literary reading in Toronto back in the 1990s. And I can't remember what I was doing or what I was doing wrong in the way that I was holding the books. Like, was I holding something like a glass of wine or a cup of coffee in the other hand? I can't remember, but there was something awkward about the way that I presented the books to her. And she very rudely said, well, I can't, you've got to t turn it around. Or you've got to do this or do that. I can't. And I just got so... <laughs> I was so humiliated by the way she snapped at me that I didn't really want her to uh, sign the damn books after after that, and I, I will never read her. <laughs> every time I think of her faith, she really snapped at me. Uh, maybe I did something terribly wrong, or it was definitely klutzy. I was clumsy, but she was really snapped at me. Okay, now, on the record from here on in, one of my most delightful encounters with a writer was the great Canadian novelist and short story writer Alistair MacLeod, who's now been dead for a few years, but I saw him in Vancouver at AWP. Do you know what that is? That's, what does AWP stand for? Authors, Writers, and Poets? Why would they say author and writer together? But anyway, I think that's what it stands for. And I finagled my way in to that conference when I found out about it by being a volunteer. I believe it was 2005 or something. And Alistair MacLeod was the keynote speaker. And he's very recognizable. He was maybe in his 70s at that time. And he, there's th a thousand people or more at AWP. But I saw him walk in and I went up and said hello to him. And I mean, I wasn't in my capacity as a volunteer. I wasn't wearing a volunteer badge or anything. But he greeted me so warmly and thanked me for such a warm welcome. And he talked in this most ebulliently cheerful way to me. For several minutes and finally I had to stop him and say um just so you know I'm actually not staff here so and he's oh no 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 and he was just being so friendly to me it was one of the most delightful encounters I've ever had with an author I still have never read any of his writing which is which is ridiculous but his keynote speech was quite dry he was not as personable sitting standing at the podium with, with to a 500 or a thousand people as he had been with me and as he Everybody says he is in his writing, but I will never forget the quote that he put. I was, I was the only one in the audience who I laughed out loud when he quoted, I think it's apocryphal. I haven't been able to find that it actually happened, but apparently Thomas Hardy was said to have opined about Henry James's writing that Henry James chewed more than he bit off. And having been traumatized by having to study Henry James at graduate school, that just tickled my funny bone, and I guffawed loudly, and everybody turned their head to look at me. Nobody else was laughing. I thought, it's, that's, that's Henry James in a nutshell, so I've always remembered that. Anyway, I'm getting a little rambly here. When I meet a writer that I really love, I often gush too much, and the one that I really regret, because I met him at three different queer literary events, Well, two gay writers events, and the third one was AWP, and the third time, he didn't remember me from one event to the next, I don't think, um, but I gushed so much the third time that I met him that I think I made him uncomfortable. I had a maybe four or five interactions with him over three days where I'd find another book and bought it and get him to sign it, and, and I just realized by the end, Sean, you really shouldn't try to talk to writers whose work you love that deeply because you just end up making a fool of yourself. I kind of avoided literary events for a few years after that. <laughs> I still think he wouldn't remember me on whatever it was I said or the gushing way I said it. Probably he 
you wouldn't remember any of that, but I just, eh, it's not really who you are. You know, I wasn't, I was just a fan girl. And I attended a Key West Literary Seminar in Key West in the mid-1990s. That was an experience of a lifetime in terms of getting a chance to meet and schmooze with almost all of my favorite gay writers at that time. One of the writers that was there was Tony Kushner, who was the who wrote Angels in America. I got my copy of the two volumes of the play signed, and he was a little bit flirty, and I had a little bit of a week-long affair with an American guy who was very involved in ACT UP, political AIDS activist group, and he was very political, very angry, very shouty, and a good kisser. <laughs> but... I'm political, but I'm not shouty, and I'm not militant, and I'm not a uh, demonstrator ty type of person. So, I remember being in the audience at a panel event by the uh, drama, that included the drama critic of the New York Times at the time, Frank Rich, who has always been very supportive about AIDS issues and gay rights and stuff. And this guy that I was with, we were in the audience together, and he stood up and confronted Frank Rich on something that he didn't think was right about maybe the New York Times, or I don't know what it was, but I just remember <laughs> shrinking in the audience like, no! <laughs> and the, the part that was about uh, Tony Kushner was maybe after that event or after another event where this guy, my, my boyfriend, had been screaming at one of the panelists on, about something or other, Tony Kushner came up to him afterwards when we were standing together, and I think maybe we were even holding hands, I don't remember, but, and started screaming at my, this guy. And I was standing there, and I had already met Tony Kushner and had a very friendly, sweet conversation, kind of flirty conversation with him. And uh, I was like, oh my god, I can't handle this, I can't handle this. But I'm sure he was just angry at my boyfriend because uh, Tony Kushner wanted me. It's the most logical explanation, don't you think? Another really memorable encounter with a writer that wasn't particularly awkward, or at least not on my side, was the Canadian novelist Scott Simons. I was uh, sad to see when I was preparing to make this video, he passed away in 2009. I hadn't known that. He was 75. I saw him at a reading in Toronto in the 1990s, and he had been living in what he called exile in Morocco for 30 years. He'd had a little bit of a sex scandal with a much younger man whose parents accused him of kidnapping. There was a big age difference. I don't think there was anything It wasn't below the age of consent, but then the younger man's parents went to the press and blah, blah, blah. So he went, went to first Mexico and then Morocco. And apparently, according to Wikipedia, he moved back to Canada uh, before he died, which I hadn't known. He made a return trip for a reading and I went to his reading and got, he wrote two novels, both very gay themed, neither of which I have read. The first one was Plast Darms, and the second one was Helmet of Flesh, and I believe I had both of them to get signed. I was probably first in line. And he was, I don't think he was smoking cigars, but he looked like this big cigar smoking hippie, gruff voice, and he said to me, so what do you do for a living? This is not something I've divulged on booktube and it was ancient history for me i only did it for a couple of years and it wasn't didn't really work out for me and i kind of awkward about admitting it but at that time i was a practicing psychotherapist so i said uh i'm a psychotherapist he said really i need one immediately and i think he was joking but it was just what do you say to that uh do you want my card or how long are you down for <laughs> never forget that also uh walking to a literary reading i happened to meet up with shyam salvadurai who's a sri lankan canadian gay writer whose first novel funny boy i absolutely love and he's at that time anyway he was really cute and I struck up a conversation, and it was, I didn't, gosh, I didn't, like it was something about him that's softer or less intimidating, and I think I told him I was from Saskatchewan originally, he said that he knew the Saskatchewan poet. Lorna Crozier was living in Saskatchewan at that time, and I said, oh, do you know her face? Sex Lives of Vegetables poem cycle? And he said, no. I said, well, I can't quote you the entire 
uh, series of poems, but my favorite line is, Carrots are fucking the earth! <laughs> Which is that natural line from Lorna Crozier's poem. The cycle is called The Sex Lives of Vegetables, and uh, we had a little bonding moment over carrots fucking the earth. One of the most spontaneous encounters I had with a writer, and I will respect his privacy by not going into any details, but one day I was, I lived in the gay ghetto in Toronto, Church Street, and I was in this, the bookstore, still there, I think, the famous bookstore called This Ain't the Rosedale Library. I'm just browsing around, and I saw an older man peering into the window like this, and I looked, and I thought, that's Timothy Findlay! who was a very well-known Canadian novelist at that time. I've never really connected with this picture. But as a cultural presence in Canada, he was a avuncular gay icon. And so there he was, looking through the window, and then he came into the store, and I was like, oh my god. I think I'd seen him at readings and stuff, but he was on CBC Radio every day or every week commenting on this or that. He was just a real big name in Canadian culture. And I had a friend visiting me, and we went to lunch just down the street to this, I think it was an Italian restaurant, I don't really remember. Damned if he and his partner, his lover, Bill Whitehead, I believe it's something Whitehead, Bill Whitehead, I want to say, and a woman came in and sat basically right beside us, or you know, it was a small little restaurant, and there was only, we were the only customers, and they gossiped, and this woman, it, it ended up that she was his publisher. They gossiped about the Governor General's Award nominees and various writers and his issues for an hour. Then Timothy Findy went out side for five minutes to plug the meter to put more money in the meter and his partner and this woman started talking about him like and I won't say anything it's just not respectful even though he's you know long long dead and buried that uh, too it's all written in my diary so someday but that was pretty amazing I once went to a reading in Toronto with Alice Munro and Robertson Davies I won't say any more about uh, Robertson Davies for now I've been not scolded, but I've been challenged in a very fascinating way by remembered reads. So I will. I'm giving uh, Robertson Davies a rethink. But I had no interest in getting books signed by him, but Alice Munro I, I already worshipped. And so I brought every book that I owned by her. And I think I was even first in line for the book signings. And I, I knew the protocol that you're supposed to have the book open to the title page. So I had the stack like this. This many, but maybe 12 books or something, uh, all ready for her to go. And then she came and sat down, and I remember, I don't remember, I don't precisely remember that I was the first, but I was very close to the beginning of the line. I put the stack of books on her table, and I said, sorry to do this to you. And at that moment, festival or harborfront staff came over and scolded me and said, um, this is, sorry, this is just too many books. Maybe you could pick out one or two your favorites to get her to sign and Alice Monroe was sitting there with her lips pursed and I thought oh Sean you totally screwed up and I was pouting as I thought this might be the only chance I ever get to have books signed by Alice Monroe so I very reluctantly just chose the hardcovers and you know two-thirds of the books were were paperback so I, I just got the hardcover signed and that that was a very awkward moment <laughs> and I did get a chance to see her at least once maybe twice more at readings over the years and get some more signed and I will this is basically my last story and it's maybe my made the deepest impression on me my other favorite short story writer I've talked about her often will eventually do some in-depth videos if I ever manage to put two intelligent sentences together to talk about her writing is the short story writer Mavis Gallant and Mavis Gallant lived in Paris she was Canadian and she came back to Canada to receive an award at the Harborfront Festival in about 1994. My cousins and my roommate, and he was as um, into Mavis Gallant as I was. And as soon as the reading was over, we knew where the book signing was going to happen. And we found that there was a door that you could open right beside the table. And we could step outside and have a cigarette. We were dying. We were heavy smokers. And dying for a cigarette so we were smoking and she hadn't come over to the table yet and while we're standing outside this glass it was all glass right and while we're outside smoking Mavis Gallant came around the corner and she locked eyes with me and she pointed at me with this 
naughty smile like i know what you're doing or you are bad boys and it was just the most electrifying enigmatic moment of my life to be to have mavis gallant lock eyes in such a freakingly affirming way <laughs> so i just felt like i'd been struck by lightning and my friend craig too and we were like oh my god so then we we got in line i think we were the first in line and I had a stack of books. I hadn't learned my lesson, or maybe I hadn't had the bad experience with Alice Monroe yet. But Mavis didn't care, and she was very. She's not a. She doesn't suffer fools gladly, and you'll you'll understand that by the end of the story. But she was very pleasant, and she. I told her my name, and she inscribed each. I had twelve or fifteen of her books, and they were all kind of beat up softcover editions that I'd picked up at used bookstores over the years. None of them were first editions, or maybe one was. She signed every one to Sean Mooney, Mavis Gallant. And after about the sixth or seventh book, she said, I'm going to be dreaming. Your your name's going to be in my dreams tonight or something. And I thought, hoo, 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 hoo. Try, you know, trying to milk this moment for all it was worth just because I'm an idiot. <laughs> I said, oh, well, maybe you can uh, use it in one of your stories someday. And she shot me a look. If looks could kill, and she said, I don't need any help with names for my stories. I choose my own names. Thank you very much. And she she was very short, very curt, but there was still a little bit of a whimsy in it. But I just said, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> kind of stepped in it then, didn't I? <laughs> uh, never forget that as long as I live. So, much more recently, and this much more successfully, the author of my favorite novel, Madeleine Tien, her novel is Do Not Say We Have Nothing, she came to Tokyo this year as part of Canada's sesquicentennial 150th anniversary of the Confederation to do a lecture at the Canadian Embassy in Tokyo. I found out about it, and I went, and I barrage the Canadian Embassy in Tokyo with so many emails about every aspect of it that they knew who I was when I showed up to pick up my free ticket. They said, oh, you're Sean Mooney. We were hoping you'd make it because I was just so excited. And there would not be a book signing, but they would try to bring her over to me because they knew how enthusiastic I was. They couldn't guarantee anything. And yes, they brought Madeline Tian over to me where I was sitting. And she was so gracious and wonderful. And she signed my book and my friend's book. And we chatted for about five minutes. And I was a fangirl, but I I may be growing up a little bit because I didn't humiliate myself. And uh, we had a lovely chat. Anyway, how about your encounters, awkward or otherwise, with authors? I'd love to hear, hear them in the comments section. Or maybe you want to do a video. And that's all I have to say about that for now. Thanks for stopping by.